An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 4, May 22nd, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, I concluded the last session by interpreting the claim that the whole is the true, and also by trying to tell you something about the place of the concept of system in dialectical philosophy, and specifically in the idealist and Hegelian form of dialectical philosophy. Now you may think, and this is a point of considerable importance, that the concept of system itself is precisely what cannot apply to dialectic, as I have attempted to show. For this concept suggests a philosophy of origins, that is to say, a philosophy where the totality is in a certain sense unfolded on the basis of an absolutely first principle. And indeed, when we speak of system, we generally think of a seamless, and wholly self-contained structure of thought, something we would describe in logical terms as a closed deductive context. And in a deductive context of this kind, everything else is generally derived by inference from a single highest principle. If you proceed inductively, on the other hand, and instead of deriving everything from some such highest principle, you attempt to advance from the particular to the universal, then, according to traditional logical doctrine, you can never be completely certain of the matter in question. Thus, thus, if up to this point all human beings in the past or in the past have died, and you extrapolate from this that human beings are mortal, you are not yet justified in purely logical terms in concluding that human beings in every case will actually die since it is at least possible that one will fail to do so. But if there were something about the principle of the human being which ensured our mortality, we could be relieved of this difficulty and could confidently affirm such a claim as purely a priori. The traditional conception of system is precisely one which involves strict derivation from a single specific principle, and in that sense, it represents the opposite of what I said at the start about Hegelian philosophy. I should now like to try and show you, taking another passage from the phenom Phenomenology of Spirit, that the Hegelian concept of system, or to put it in less pedantic and historical terms, that the dialectical concept of totality is actually the opposite of that approach. And here I should also like to present, once again, the central motif of the dialectic in a somewhat different light. I am talking about the idea that the truth can only be grasped as result, where this result is not just something that emerges at some given point, but rather includes the process within itself as the necessary condition of its own validity, of its own meaning. The passage I wish to read to you in this context is also drawn from the preface to the phenomenology and is particularly relevant here because it reveals the contrast with the tradition or the traditional conception of system and thus also with the static conception of truth in an especially striking way. Hegel writes, Among the various consequences that follow from what has just been said, this one in particular can be stressed that knowledge is only actual and can only be expounded as science or as system. And furthermore, that a so-called basic proposition or principle of philosophy, if true, is also false, just because it is only a principle or basic propos proposition. In the specific context of the history of philosophy, this claim is explicitly aimed at Fichte's doctrine of knowledge in its first version of 1794, a work which indeed in a certain sense is pre presupposed by Hegel's system and which does effectively attempt to derive the whole of philosophy from some such a first principle or proposition. But this claim of Hegel's stands in downright contradiction to what we have just been talking about because the criterion of a deductive framework, that is, of a self-contained derivation of consequences from a highest principle, is precisely the criterion of non-contradiction. 
If a contradictory moment does arise, then according to the rules of traditional logic, the deductive structure appears to have been violated. You can already see from this that Hegelian philosophy, for quite a quite specific reason, finds itself opposed not only to traditional philosophy and the traditional metaphysics of the permanent and the immutable, but also even to traditional logic. This means the Hegelian philosophy does not recognize the principle of contradiction, insofar as this philosophy holds that thought itself does not find its truth by proceeding in a wholly non-contradictory manner. Rather, it is driven into repeated contradiction, precisely through its own rigor and possesses its logical unity, its non-contradictory character, only as a fully developed totality not in the single steps which it undertakes. This is a further challenge which dialectical thinking poses for us, a challenge which you can already appreciate right here once you properly understand this claim that a so-called basic principle or proposition of philosophy, if true, is also false, just because it is only a principle or basic proposition. In order to clarify this once again, we could say that, if for idealist philosophy, the idea of the absoluteness of thinking stands at the very beginning, the idea that there is therefore nothing which is not thought, and that consequently, and that consequently as Ficht himself expresses it, the thinking principle, the I, posits itself as something absolute, then we could say, and this step is already accomplished by Ficht, very much in Hegel's sense that the first principle is necessarily also already false. For the concept of this thinking, which is posited here necessarily involves the moment to which such thinking relates. There is no thinking, there is no thought, which does not involve something thought, something to which it refers. There is thus no thought which, insofar as it thinks, is not more than merely a thought. But if we grasp the issue in this way, and Ficht uh, most emphatically took this step, which I am outlining to you here, if we ponder its full implications, then we might say that the principle with which philosophy begins, and the principle of Hegel and Ficht in this decisive point is the same, is at once true, insofar as there is indeed nothing which we do not know through thought. Yet at the same time, it is false, for this apparently absolute origin also involves its own op opposite, and the thought of an absolute and creative eye or pure idea already inevitably involves the thought of the non-I, the object to which thought relates. Hegel continues, It is therefore easy to refute it, i.e. a first principle. The refutation consists of pointing out its defect, and it is defective because it is only the universal or principle is only the beginning. If the refutation is thorough, it is derived and developed from the principle itself, not accomplished by counter-assertions and random thoughts from outside. From these remarks alone, you can recognize two decisive features of the dialectical method as a whole. Firstly, that refutation in Hegel does not bear the usual meaning, as it does when we say that some claim or proposition is simply false. Rather, refutation here means pointing out the defect of the claim or proposition, as Hegel says. In other words, with every case of finite knowledge, it is pointed out that inasmuch as it is a merely finite knowledge, and we can express anything specific or determinate at all only as something finite, it is precisely and necessarily not yet the whole. Yet since, yet since is the whole alone, which is supposed to be the true, Every thought is also to that extent false, although not false in the sense of a particular arbitrary or mistaken judgment that demands correction, as a kind of intellectual defect, but rather false on account of its being a finite judgment. For every finite judgment precisely shows itself, as seems evident, not to be that whole from which alone the concept of truth according to Hegel can be derived. But this also implies that this falsehood is not an arbitrary or contingent feature for its own part, not something which is external to philosophy, to the movement of the concept, but something into which we necessarily find ourselves drawn. In reality, this thought can already be seen as a Kantian one, 
although in Kant it is not perhaps presented with the same consistency and clarity that it eventually acquires in Hegel. For it is the thought that there are certain types of proposition, and this is still expressed in Kant in a much more limited manner, which specifically go beyond our positive experience, that is, in which we apply our conceptual capacities beyond what can be furnished or is substantiated by the material of experience. Thus, we inevitably find ourselves entangled in contradictions, and Kant attempts at the same time in the second main section of the Critique of Pure Reason and the Transcendental Logic to show how we may none nonetheless resolve and respond to these inevitable contradictions. This is a remarkable idea which stands right there in Kant but is not further pursued by Kant himself. On the one hand, as we are repeatedly told in the Critique of Pure Reason, we are necessarily caught up in these contradictions, and no epistemological reflection is capable of curing us of this predicament. On the other hand, Kant does believe that he is able to offer a solution to the problem, namely by distinguishing between the different ways in which we may apply the concepts of noumena and phenomena, for which, according to him, quite different laws are supposed to hold. You can see, therefore, that a certain kind of contradiction is also acknowledged in Kant, but we can see that the experience of contradiction which persists in Kant almost malgré lui-même, we might say, is expressly raised to consciousness in Hegel, is almost turned, we might say, into the organon of philosophical thought in general. This means, therefore, on the one hand, that while reason necessarily becomes involved in contradictions, it also possesses the power to go beyond these contradictions and to correct itself. And according to Hegel, this is the very essence of the movement of the concept, the essence of philosophy itself. You have to keep both aspects in mind if you wish to understand dialectical thought properly. The unavoidability of contradictions, on the one hand, and the driving force of these contradictions on the other, <clears throat> where this latter leads to the overcoming or sublation of the contradictions in a higher form of truth, and also in constant correlation with this for Hegel, in a higher form of reality. For in Hegel, truth and reality are not conceived as entirely separate from each other, but as two interrelated dynamic moments which depend upon one another, and are only constituted in relation to one another in the first place. The second thing which I wanted to point out with regard to these few Hegelian remarks has to some extent already been anticipated in our previous reflections, and it is this. The reputation of the truth of some proposition or the negation of some proposition, or to introduce at last the watchword you have surely all been waiting for, the antithesis to the initial thesis, is not something brought in from the outside, but that which properly arises out of the consistent pursuit of the original thought itself. If you wish to develop a genuinely philosophical concept of dialectic, and to free yourselves from, from the debased and pre-philosophical conception of dialectic that can be encountered everywhere, for which dialectic just amounts to saying something like, well, whatever one person may claim, one can somehow also say the opposite, you will see from Hegel's words that this popular relativistic wisdom is incompatible with the thought which Hegel was actually trying to develop here. For it is the thought that the antithesis is not introduced in opposition to the initial proposition from without, something which he would certainly have repudiated as a purely sophistical dispute about contrary opinions. Rather, the opposing claim or proposition must always be derived imminently from the initial claim or proposition itself, as I have already briefly tried to suggest with regard to the relationship between the I and the non-I, which indeed furnishes the fundamental theme for Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. To think dialectically, therefore, is not to confront one prop proposition of whatever kind with some other contrary opinion from outside. Rather, it is to drive thought to the point where it comes to recognize its own finitude, its own falsehood, and is thereby also driven on beyond itself. I would now like to read out the rest of the paragraph from the preface, but I should point out beforehand that when Hegel dismisses the kind of 
external position which is opposed to a thought from the outside instead of being drawn from the very thought itself he speaks expressly of merely assurances or random thought he speaks it's oh, fuck he speaks expressly of mere assurances or random thoughts if you consider hegel philosophy as a whole hegel's philosophy as a whole you'll be able to learn a lot more from these two words than they express at this point if taken merely in isolation for while it is true that thought itself receives this tremendous emphasis in hegel that it does indeed claim to develop the absolute from out of itself this must also always be understood to mean that thought specifically constitutes itself in and as objectivity if we can say in an eminent sense that hegelian dialectic is a subjective dialectic namely if the absolute as hegel puts it or puts it once is actually subject this means that thought and emphatically on every individual level finds its measure in and as objectivity and the pathos of this dialectical philosophy in its entirety lies invariably in this the judgment of the subject insofar it is as it is merely reflective or ratio ratio judgment insofar as it reaches out solely from itself to the object without surrendering itself to the discipline power or density of the object with which it must engage and the subject in question always finds itself convinced or convicted of its own convicted of its own arbitrary and contingent character or as hegel also often likes to say of its own vanity the contradiction or counterclaim which is not drawn from the matter itself into which the matter itself is not imminently drawn or which is simply introduced from the outside all this is merely ascribed to the contingent subject in its finitude becomes a mere opinion uh, becomes that doxa which you already find subjected to the severest criticism in plato and the path on which you will find that severest criticism in plato or oh, fuck and the path on which you will find that truth now becomes subject sorry my reading is terrible today and the path on which you will find that truth now becomes subject becomes absolute subject always involves the correction of all merely particular opinion in and as the objectivity which thinking subjectivity encounters at every individual level the refutation as hegel goes on to say would therefore properly consist in the further development of the principle and in thus remedy remedying the defectiveness if it did not mistakenly pay attention solely to its negative action without awareness of its progress and result on their positive side too this passage takes us into the innermost character of dialectical thought which i am hoping to convey to you for the thought here involves the remarkable admission that the refutation in question is not what is normally described as a refutation in traditional logic namely the process in which we take a certain thought and demonstrate that it is false for ref for refutation in hegel's sense arises not against the original thought but rather with the thought itself and out of its own power thus hegelian dialectical thought generally and marxian dialectical thought too as long as it is critical thinking is always a form of imminent critique when we subject some structure or other to explicit critique then this critique and this is a popular way of expressing it can be a case of of transcend transcendent critique that is it can measure the structure or reality in question against certain assumptions which seem indeed to be secure and reliable to the one who is passing judgment but which are not grounded in the matter itself on the other hand it may be a case of imminent critique that is a process where what is criticized is measured against its own assumptions its own principles of form now the path of dialectic is always that of imminent critique that is in the sense i have just been explaining we cannot simply confront the matter in question with some criterion external to it or introduce any assurances or random thoughts of our own rather the matter in question 
if it is to be disclosed as it is, must be measured in itself against its own concept. Thus, to offer you an example from the materialist dialectic, where Marx furnishes a critique of capitalist society, he will never do so by contrasting it with a supposedly ideal society, such as a socialist society. That kind of thing is scrupulously avoided by Marx at every turn, just as Hegel never allowed himself at any point to paint utopia or the fully realized idea as such. There's a serious taboo on this in both versions of dialectic. Therefore, when Marx submits a form of society to critique, he does so by measuring it against what the society in question claims of itself to be. Thus, Marx will say, This society claims to be one of free and just exchange, so let us see if it lives up to these, its own demands. Or again, this claims to be a society of free subjects engaged in exchange as contracting parties. Let us see how it stands with this demand. All of these moments which actually characterize Marx's method, and which also make it so difficult to grasp Marx's method properly, instead of misinterpreting it precisely as a theory of an ideal society, something which was very far from his mind, all of these moments are already present in the Hegelian passage we have just been discussing. But I should like at this point to go on to discuss something else. For you have already seen that dialectical negation is not a simple correction or counterclaim to a false thought, but rather, if you want to put it this way, the further extension, or as Hegel rightly describes it, the development of the initial thought, and thus the remedying of its defective character. In this sense, it is a genuine correction, and not something which simply eliminates the thought itself. If therefore to take up the Marxian example again, the thought of a free and just society is subjected to critique, the idea of freedom and justice is not thereby eliminated or dissolved in the dialectical method. Rather, we are shown how this idea is not yet realized in the reality which is compared with the idea, and the concepts of freedom and justice which have prevailed hitherto are also themselves modified in the process. That is to say, they cease to be as abstract as they initially present themselves to thought, and thereby become more concrete. Now this all sounds harmless enough, and you may even breathe a sigh of relief and say, well, it seems the dialectic is not so terrible after all. That all this talk of contradiction was not meant so seriously. And the whole thing does not appear to conflict that much with the rules of common sense. We do not have to be so narrow in our approach. We can expand our limited thoughts and um, can go beyond them and in this way eventually reach the whole. And indeed, there is something of this common sense about the dialectic. Yet the matter is not nearly as simple as straight and straightforward as this. And here, once again, we come to a critical point in the conception of dialectic, which I would ask you to bear clearly and constantly in mind. For Hegel says that this would all be fine and good, that thought simply develops and manages to avoid refutation. But Hegel says that the critical thought, that is the thought which measures the matter against itself, which confronts the matter with itself and drives it onward, pays attention solely to its negative action, without awareness of its progress and result on their positive side. This means, in the first place, that Hegel is extraordinarily serious about refutation in his sense, that we do not simply have the whole at our disposal, that we cannot simply extend our concepts at will with a sovereign gesture of a God who assigns its proper place to everything, simply transcend the limitations of our thought and finally secure its proper place. What is demanded, rather, is that thought must really surrender itself to the dialectic without fear or favor. This springs directly from what I was trying to get over in our last session, namely that the whole is precisely not something already given, that truth is not something fixed and somehow guaranteed. On the contrary, truth itself is something which arises and emerges, is essentially result. But this also means that we cannot deploy truth by introducing it from without, that we cannot, simply by thinking dialectically, already rise above dialectic by virtue of this abstract truth. Rather, we must immerse ourselves in this dialectical process itself. 
We could even say that there is no other possible way for us to reach the whole except by exposure to the partial, for we do not possess the whole. <sighs> Only by entrusting ourselves to this partiality, by persevering through this limitation, by recognizing the critical movement itself as the truth, is it possible for us to reach truth at all? On the other hand, and here you see how serious the concept of dialectic in Hegel really is, this means that the next step must also be taken with full seriousness. This step should not simply be relativized as such, insofar as it sees itself in turn only as a partial moment of the whole. For this implies in turn that the next step, namely that reflective negativity, which means, which manifests the defective character of the finite is not yet itself the truth either. For this step, insofar as it inevitably misunderstands itself, turns into untruth once again, and is thus driven on beyond itself. And the inevitable untruth in which it is then caught up is just what prevents it from appearing simply as an extension or correction of the false. It is what necessarily and inescapably lends it the appearance of an absolute contradiction. You can see from all this that the concept of contradiction, despite all the relevant qualifications, is indeed an extraordinarily serious matter here. To take another historical example, if the men who brought about the liberation of bourgeois society during the French Revolution had not seriously regarded this bourgeois society as the realization of a just society as something absolute, if their own limited intellectual perspective in this regard were not effectively at work as an explosive force, then the revolution as a whole would never have come to pass. But at the same time, this defective understanding involved in turn that particular limitation which made this into a merely relative historical achievement after all. I could perhaps express this thought in another way, which serves to bring out something I attempted to introduce at the beginning, namely the idea of the temporal core of truth itself. For it is here that you probably approach the deepest point in Hegelian thought, and from which you may be able to grasp that idea. It implies that no thought can actually be thought which frees itself from time, from its own temporal core. Thus a thought or a political thought and the phenomenology of spirit itself is a politically conceived work in a preeminent sense, which tried to relate immediately to what is absolute, to a justice beyond time, instead of growing from the concrete conditions of its own time and measuring itself against them. Such a thought would not actually be in a superior position to these concrete conditions of the time. It would only be more abstract and would fall powerless precisely by virtue of this greater or abstractness. It would forfeit the very power to become actual, which ultimately justifies the truth of a thought from the dialectical perspective. This is, so to speak, the political or practical dimension of the idea of the temporal core of truth. This implies there is no universal truth resting statically within itself, and no such truth about society, for truth itself only ever emerges from the concrete situation. And once it absolves itself from the concrete situation or believes that it can simply rise above the latter, it thereby finds itself condemned to powerlessness. It can only bring about the very opposite of what it believes it is able to effect. I have introduced, I have introduced these reflections here as a model to show you something else which is also extraordinarily important for the general climate of dialectical thinking. I am talking about the continual interaction between an extremely theoretical thought and an orientation to praxis. Here too, we find that dialectical thought is fundamentally different from traditional thought, for dialectical thought does not just present us with an elaborated theoretical system from which practical conclusions are produced only after the entire theory has been duly settled. Rather, all levels of dialectical thought, we might say, 
effectively yield sparks which leap from the extreme pole of theoretical reflection to the extreme pole of practical intervention. And if I have indicated the logical structure of the thought here, the unavoidable limitation of the contradiction involved, or the central role of concrete political praxis in contrast to an abstract political utopia, for example, this must be recognized as, recognized as a crucial issue for dialectical thought in general. We must really accustom ourselves to the idea that the unity of theory and praxis, as conceived in all dialectical thought, already in Fichte and certainly in Hegel and Marx, is already the kind of unity which does not merely spring forth at the end, but consists in just such a continual interaction as I have tried to suggest. And this itself is also a consequence of what we have called the temporal core of truth, a consequence which is fully acknowledged by Hegel. For this means that truth itself cannot be set over against time in a purely contemplative sense. Rather, in possessing a temporal configuration of its own, truth always possesses a quite emphatic relationship to possible praxis as well. The paragraph from Hegel which we have been discussing concludes as follows. The genuinely positive exposition of the beginning is thus also, conversely, just as much a negative attitude towards it, towards its initially one-sided form of being immediate or purpose. It can therefore be taken equally well as a refutation of the principle that constitutes the basis of the system, but it is more correct to regard it as a demonstration that the basis or principle of the system is, in fact, only its beginning. This effectively recapitulates what we already heard in the last session, that the definition of zoology, say, as the theory of animals, is not identical to, do, to a developed zoology. That this bare principle or proposition doesn't give you the zoology. You can only possess that when you advance concretely from this definition or its concept and explore the development of particular animals in their relationship to one another. But the passage actually says more than this. For when you hear in this way that a first principle or proposition is only a beginning, this again may sound quite harmless. Thus, you might understand it in the following sense and say, of course, if you have such a first principle like Fick's initial proposition, you have to develop it further in order to acquire richer content gradually as you proceed. But here too, I should remind you once again that conceptual expressions such as only a beginning bear much more weight in Hegel. It must be taken much more seriously than you may initially imagine. For it is not just that such a principle or proposition must gradually come to acquire rather more color and more contour, as non-dialectical and traditional modes of thought might typically put it at this point. It is rather that such a principle or proposition, as long as it is merely a beginning, as long as it is merely abstract, as Hegel would say, is actually quite false. And the abstract in Hegel does not mean quite the same thing as the concept of, abst of abstractness in our ordinary mode of thinking. What is abstract for Hegel is not simply the universal as such, <clears throat> but rather what is isolated, the particular determination insofar as, as it has been detached, abstracted in the literal sense of the term from the whole in which it belongs. And the movement of thought itself as a movement towards the whole is in a Hegelian sense a movement towards the concrete, understood in the sense of what has grown together, just as one of the determinations of truth for Hegel is that the truth is indeed essentially concrete. In this connection, therefore, the abstract is the merely particular, that which remains merely isolated, and the beginning is false precisely because it is abstract, because it is isolated because it has not yet passed over into the whole, or because it has not yet come to itself. Thus, the relation between the development or execution of the task and its simple beginning is not like that between the final image and what appeared on the drawing board in the form of a pre-delineated schema. We are talking rather of the very process in which truth emerges for itself. These are the things which I wanted to get over to you today by way of introduction to the question of dialectic.